Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to begin this morning in verse number 27. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 27. At Balfour, we affirm the truth of 2 Timothy 3.16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Let's pray together this morning. Almighty God, we come before you, Lord, this morning just humbly. Lord, just mindful of you as the one true God, the creator of heaven and earth. Lord, yet loving us so much that you would send our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that he would die for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Father, I pray that you would fix our minds on you this morning. I pray that you would draw the lost to yourself, Lord, that you would build up and encourage the believer. And Father, I pray that as I have this wonderful privilege to preach your word, Lord, I pray that I would take my Lord Jesus at his word, that his grace is sufficient for his strength is made perfect in weakness. Lord, please help me as I proclaim your word faithful to the text. Lord, allow me to be true and faithful and honorable to you, and I pray that you would get all the glory and the honor this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse number 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, And the rest I will set in order when I come. Let's walk through the text this morning with ears to hear and a heart to obey. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look to your Bible, verse number 27. Therefore... Whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. It's important as we begin that we need to establish what constitutes an unworthy manner in order to avoid it. Imagine outlining for a child the serious consequences of violating a rule while failing to define what a violation looks like. Now, this phrase, an unworthy manner, literally means unworthily. It's used only twice in the New Testament here and verse number 29. One commentator defines the phrase as doing something that does not square with the character or nature of something. Consider for a moment the call upon a Christian life. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 1, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. The Bible says in Philippians 1, 27, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of God the gospel. You see, if we look to the text, the irreverent actions of those in Corinth did not measure up with the reverence the Lord's Supper demands. Look back at verse number 20, and let's read 20 through 22. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? 
What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. When we think of the Lord's Supper, what is the Lord's Supper a proclamation of? The sacrificial death of Christ. Look at verses 23 through 26. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Looking back at verse number 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. That word translated guilty is a legal term. It comes from a word that has the root meaning to be entangled. It's a very serious term. In Mark 16, 44, it was used of Jesus as he was stood before the Sanhedrin and was questioned by the high priest. We read there, and they all condemned him to be deserving of death. You see, here in Corinth, a shift in sides has occurred. They were drinking the cup of the Lord. They were eating the bread and drinking the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. And they were responsible for their actions. Doing so led them to being guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. It's important to note here the phrase unworthy manner is not describing the person. If our own worthiness was the manner, none of us could come and eat of this bread and drink of this cup. We must come under the righteousness of Christ. The unworthy manner is describing the actions of the person. One commentator notes, to come to the Lord's table, clinging to one's sin, not only dishonors the ceremony, but it also dishonors his body and blood, treating lightly the gracious sacrifice of Christ for believers. The question that we need to ask this morning is, are we coming to this table clinging to sin? Don't merely leave it at the front door to pick it up as you exit. Don't store it under the pew. Don't conceal it in your pocket thinking it is out of sight. Confess your sin and forsake it now. We must be cautious as we approach this text. The theme of judgment saturates this text. We see the word judgment in verses 29 and 34. We see discerning in verse 29. We see the phrase, we would judge in verse 31. We see the phrase, we would not be judged in verse 31. We see the phrase, when we are judged in verse 32. And we see the phrase that we may not be condemned in verse 32. Understanding that the Lord's Supper can be eaten in an unworthy manner, we must look at this passage and see that it can be eaten in a worthy manner. Verses 28 through 30 outline how the Lord's Supper is to be observed. Look to the Bible verse number 28. Here we see that the Lord's Supper requires examination. The Bible says, but let a man examine himself. That phrase examine is a command. It means to test and evaluate the genuineness of something, or in this case today, of someone. How is this done? How are we to examine ourselves. A couple of questions to consider. Is your attitude consistent with that of a follower 
of Jesus? Have your actions been that of someone walking in faithfulness to Christ? Do you understand what the Lord's Supper is and why we observe it? From a practical sense, look at verse number 22. Do you despise the church of God? Do you look down on others as having no value? Do you shame those who have nothing, making sure they feel as though they have no value? Look to the Bible, verse 28, but let a man examine, him, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Examination must come before participation. Why is this necessary? Look at verse 29. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself. Imagine for a moment, as a Christian, reflecting upon the events that took place at Calvary with indifference. Imagine being a Christian and reading that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures and shrugging your shoulders. Imagine being a Christian and reading, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us us. Imagine being a Christian and reading that, and your response is, yep, the game starts at one, the restaurant is filling up, I sure hope the deacons will go ahead and pass out the cracker and the juice so we can get going. Doing those things, those are the actions of one not discerning the Lord's body, failing to give an adequate and thorough evaluation of exactly what the bread and the cup symbolize. The Lord's Supper should be a time of deep reflection as the Christian considers the reality that Jesus died in our place. The truth of 2 Corinthians 5.21 should fill our minds. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Look to the Bible, verse 30. Here we see the consequences of eating the bread and drinking the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. The consequences of eating and drinking judgment to oneself, not discerning the Lord's body. The very actions of verses 27 through 29 are now applied to the church there, the situation in Corinth. Look at verse number 30. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Please note three principles in this verse. First, God has brought judgment upon this church. Weakness, illness, death. That word sleep points to the death of a believer in the New Testament. Second, this is not a hypothetical situation. The church in Corinth would have in mind members who were weak, sick, and even died. Look closely at verse 30. Not one. Not a couple, not a few. The word the Holy Spirit gives us is many. Third, do not dismiss the importance God places upon the attitudes and actions of His church. In Acts chapter 5, lying to the Holy Spirit brought death to Ananias and Sapphira. 
as we'll see in a moment, the judgment that God was bringing there in Corinth, the judgment that he brings to each one of us, the, the, um, the, the discipline, the chastening that we'll see in just a moment, it's for the believer's good. It's for God's glory. Listen to what the Bible tells us in Titus, that the Christian is looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Look to your Bibles, verse number 31. Here we see how the judgment outlined in verse 30 could have been avoided. Verse 31 offers the reason for the self-examination in verse number 28. For if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. A clear text with profound implications. Had the Corinthians rightly judged themselves, God's judgment would have been avoided. This judging of oneself is to be ongoing. It's to be a continual examination. The life of a Christian is one having a posture of examination. Search me, O God, and repentance. O Lord, forgive me. The Lord's Supper offers a wonderful opportunity to examine ourselves as the Scripture commands, knowing either we judge or God judges. Please understand that God's judgment in the life of a believer, God's judgment in the life of his child is not eternal judgment. It's to be viewed the way a parent instructs a child. The goal to discipline us toward maturity. This becomes clear in the next verse. Look to your Bible, verse number 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord. When we are chastened by the Lord, it is for our good. The Lord's chastening should drive us toward Him. It's never meant to drive us away from Him. According to Jude 24, it is the Lord who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. According to Philippians 1.6, it is the Lord who has begun a good work in you, and He will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. That word chastened has to do with the discipline and training of children. The Lord disciplines us to grow us to maturity. The reason, look to your Bible, verse number 32, that we may not be condemned with the world. Please turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 3. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 3. Here we see in the Scriptures the necessity and the value of the believer being chastened by the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 3. If you found your place, please say, Amen. For consider him who endures such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. 
Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Please turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 20, verse number 11. Here we will see how the Lord's discipline allows the Christian to avoid the eternal judgment, the unsaved face. The judgment, the, excuse me, the description that we are about to read describes the eternal judgment the non believer faces. If you found your place, please say, Amen. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire, This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's the judgment of the unsaved. Please turn back now to 1 Corinthians 11, and let's look at verse number 33. Paul has concluding instructions for the church. We see the word, therefore. Here is what you are supposed to do. To borrow from verse 17, the instructions I have for you are this. Therefore, my brethren, a term of affection, reminding them of their shared kinship with Paul. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Now, Obviously, this does not mean wait to begin eating once everyone has arrived. That will not solve the issue of verses 21 and 22. Instead, the instructions are to be understood as welcome one another. Share with one another. Demonstrate selflessness and not selfishness. Then verse 34, But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, And the rest I will set in order when I come. Look back at verses 17 and 18. You'll see how this section begins. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. Paul's instruction there for the church in Corinth. If your purpose is to gather together to eat your fill at the shame of others, you're at the wrong place. There's countless places in this world to assemble and engage in sin. The Lord's church must not be that place. Paul's words to the church in Corinth and the church today show us that if we'll follow the instructions of this text, we will come together for the better and not for the worse. 